okay with that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I leave it to it. Okay. So um, thank you very much for for uh, coming to today's uh, 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 convergence lecture. And today I have the pleasure to introduce Sheila Castillo as our uh, invited uh, speaker. And um, yeah, it's it's very nice to invite to, to invite Sheila here and have Sheila and to introduce her because I'm proud to say that Sheila is one of my students. So uh, <laughs> that I taught some some of what uh, what she knows uh, about uh, <laughs> ten years ago. <laughs> and um, you already saw her, her uh, short bio, um, and I think she was a bit. Too modest uh, in how she, she uh, introduced herself. Um, uh, recently, she was promoted as assistant professor at Salis at Dublin City University, and um, that's, uh, in case you don't know, a very very good department that is is uh, uh, doing very good research in the fields of translation, translation studies, machine translation, and uh, Sheila has uh, the pleasure of um, being the, the the program director of uh, MA Trans. I may in translation studies if I got the, the title right. Um, so um, that's uh, that's very good and and, and a very challenging uh, uh, role. Um, you may also know uh, Sheila from her research that uh, she has carried out in uh, empty evaluation. And uh, the topic of today's uh, talk is going to be um, uh, about the uh, empty evaluation. Um, before being promoted as, as assistant professor. Uh, she was uh, um, a research fellow at uh, the ADAPT Center. She uh, received one of the um, grants from the Irish Research Council, where she studied actually, uh, uh, where she, she carried out research in, in uh, MT evaluation. And some of the research she's going to present today is uh, as a result of that project. And also something she doesn't say, but very much appreciated in the community is the um, volume she edited recently about uh, empty quality estimation. And uh, I think that's uh, that's also a very good contribution to the field. So Sheila, thank you very much for accepting our invitation. And we're really looking forward to, to your presentation. Thank you so much, Constantine. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, as you say, it's very nice to receive an invitation because uh, Constantine was my uh, professor during my master's when I, I found out about machine translation and it started to be really excited about it. And then since the, that was some years ago, <laughs> let's not talk about numbers, but it was some some years ago. And then since then, uh, machine translation is all, all I do in research and, and all I like doing. So thanks everyone for coming today. Uh, so uh, I'm Sheila Castillo. I am from uh, Dublin City University. Uh, like Constantine say, now I am in the School of Applied Languages uh, in Salis. And today I'm going to present uh, some of the results of my work in document level machine translation evaluation. Okay. So why did I start looking into document level evaluation? So you see, when sentences are evaluated in isolation, there are a few problems that we can come across. And mostly in machine translation field until a few years ago, uh, most of the evaluation was done at the sentence level. So for example, uh, if you look at these examples that I have in this table, all the red parts here, they need to be defined in a context so we can translate and evaluate it properly. So if I say, I put it in my car, uh, for some languages, we do need to know what each is uh, to, to better translate, I put it in my car. Uh, speak English, uh, so who the order was addressed to? Is it one person or two people, or is it formal or informal? Uh, yes, she did. Uh, what did she do? How do I translate yes, she did for uh, languages that don't have that kind of construction? And my favorite is I am lonely. Uh, for example, for my language, I, uh, my mother language is Portuguese. I need to know the gender of the speaker uh, to understand uh, and translate lonely properly into the gender. But also the verb to be in English has two different translations into Portuguese. So I need to know what is going on there to be able to translate. But also I need to know what's going on there to be able to assess it. So from previous work that we did back in 2020, 
uh, we found that 33% uh, of the sentences that we test, uh, it required more context than the sentence itself to be translated and evaluated. And of those 33%, 23 required even more than two previous sentences uh, to be properly translated. Uh, so I don't know if you know, but generally when we talk about document level in machine translation, now it's changing a little bit, but it's generally uh, we talk about two sentences, two surrounding sentences of the source sentence we're trying to translate. So this shows, this experiment that we had shows that document level evaluation is important to the assessment of the contextual issues, uh, which sometimes if you have the single sentence is impossible uh, to recognize and it, that leads to mis-evaluation. Um, so here we have an example of mis-evaluation, for, uh, for example. So if you look at uh, the source sentence, I think my husband put it put it together backwards because it barely rocks. Uh, you see like, oh, I apologize, all my uh, examples are in Portuguese because that's the language I did the research on. Um, so Portuguese is a language that has gender and number and, and uh, all these uh, shenanigans. So the machine translation translated this sentence as, I think my husband put it, put it him uh, backwards because barely rock. So it puts the gender into masculine and decided not to translate each in the second. The human translator uh, decided to drop all the pronouns because it didn't know what each meant. So when these two translations were assessed, you can see that the evaluator said the machine translation was correct, but also the human translation was correct because since it was not defined, both translations are correct, even though one has a masculine gender and the other one didn't have any gender. So when we start, I hope you can see this well, when we start adding the context to that first sentence, the sentence, the source sentence one there in A, uh, you see that it's just uh, when we have um, three sentences before that source sentences, uh, that we can actually define what each is. So in the examples A, B, C, and there, uh, both human translation and machine translation, they were rated as uh, very accurate and very fluent. But when you see in example D there in the, the, the bottom of the table, you see that uh, each refers to the chair and chair in Portuguese is feminine. So, from that, uh, that when the evaluator could see that the machine translation system was actually quite wrong, if you evaluate the sentence as a total, uh, and uh, the human translation was correct. Uh, so that's so we can consider that A, B, and C, they were mis-evaluations of the translation quality for that given sentence. Um, yeah, so these are some of the works that have tried to do document level uh, machine translation evaluation up until then. Um, so since uh, 2020, uh, WMT, which is the Conference for Machine Translation, they accepted that only doing a sentence level evaluation was not enough. Uh, especially with the new NMT systems being so uh, good and fluent. So they decided also to follow our advice and uh, start doing document level evaluations as well. Uh, not for all languages, but uh, for some of them. So that's when I started with my project called DELA, Document Level Machine Translation Evaluation, that ended uh, in uh, September last year. So I am going to talk about a bit of the work that we have, the results that we had. So these are the some of the um, publications that we have. So I'm going to talk about these two first ones um, together because they were kind of more experimental that I was trying to figure out uh, what is the best methodology to give, to have document level evaluation, uh, human e evaluation at the document level. Uh, so back in 2020, the first of that publication, I looked into the differences between the sentence level and the document level evaluation methodology. 
And for that, I just wanted to look at the most common metrics for machine translation evaluation, uh, which is fluency adequacy on a Likert scale, error markup, and pairwise ranking. So I used a couple of uh, assessments. So I use most of the metrics, the kappa metrics, uh, weighted kappa, non-weighted kappa, and we calculated the inter-annotator agreement and uh, the effort that the translators spend uh, for these different tests. Um, so here, uh, sorry for the bunch of text. This is just more or less uh, a definition of each of the uh, Cohen's kappa coefficients that I used. So I used uh, uh, quite a few. I used Cohen's kappa, the weighted and non-weighted. I used Fleisch kappa, Krippendorf's alpha, and also just an inter-rated re real reliability. Uh, so for that one, I used the WMT new test set corpus from 2019. It had around 60 full texts. Uh, so I divided them into two test sets and translated from English into Brazilian Portuguese uh, with Google. But then I also translate with DeepL to do the pairwise uh, ranking. Uh, so I got four uh, professional translators to look into this. Uh, so you can see that um, uh, the task and the translators, they were distributed in a way that uh, translators would not see the same sentence twice. And the order of the tasks were randomized as well, because I tried to avoid as much bias as I could. So I looked into adequacy, fluency, and error. Uh, through the patch tool, which was a tool that we developed actually when I was a master's student uh, with Constantine a long time ago. <laughs> um, so yeah, so the, basically it was the state of the art metrics that we use. So for adequacy, I asked translators how much of the meaning uh, expressed in the source appears in the translate the translation. Give me a score from one to four. Fluency, how fluent was the translate translation? Give me a score one to four. So the translators, they had to give one score per sentence or one score per document in the different setups that I had. And for error markup, I just worked with a few because I wasn't really interested if the machine translation was good or not. I just I was just interested in the agreement uh, uh, between the translators and the methodology. Uh, so I asked translators to tag the sentence levels, tell me how many errors uh, are there in this sentence, or tell me how many errors are there in this full document. So it was pretty simple what I did. I just used a spreadsheet uh, for the pairwise ranking as well. And I put the Google Translate and the JPL outputs and asked them, tell me which sentence is better in one exercise and the other exercise, tell me which uh, document is better. Um, when I compared the two of them. And then also I asked, uh, I gave them a post-test questionnaire asking them their preferences in the methodology, how satisfied they were, how difficult it was and how much effort they felt like they had to push to do the evaluation. So here's some of the results. Uh, I apologize in advance because that was back in 2020. So I might not remember very specific, but I remember the gist of the results. Um, so you can see, so first I have two tables here, one with the translators one to four, and then we had a problem with translator number four. So I decided to add uh, uh, translator number one, I think, and then I decided to add another one. So it's loads of number. But if you follow it with me, you see that, um, that okay, so inter-annotator agreement is higher uh, for single sentence scenarios there in test set one. Uh, and there's like very, uh, that's the first time that I saw a negative kappa ever in my life is when I asked them to uh, give one score per document. So meaning that there was absolutely no agreement uh, whatsoever. Uh, and the same thing happened uh, when I added a third translator there to try to see if it was a one translator's problem, it was not. Uh, so we see that uh, the inter-annotator agreement, it was higher for adequacy, was higher in the sentence level uh, scenario, the methodology. And then for fluency, you see again that uh, for um, the document, we saw the higher internotator uh, score uh, there, 
But for test set two, we saw that there were low interannotator scores, even again, negative Kappa scores for the document level. In uh, when I added the next translator, there was an increase in uh, interannotator agreement for a sentence level scenario. So we went from 0 0.09 to 0 0.88, which is quite good. But then there was a decrease for the document level. So, uh, yeah, so we saw the internal data agreement again uh, is higher for the sentence level scenario, but we thought maybe fluency assessment would really benefit from full documents with these results that we got back then. Um, for the error annotation, we saw that um, uh, there were a higher internal annotator agreement scores for the document level scenario for binary. So basically, I asked uh, translators two questions for the errors. I just asked, um, uh, well, sorry, no, I just uh, created two types of results. One result that I call binary, if the translators agree, if there was an error, any error in that sentence or in that document. So I'm calling it binary. And then I decided to also see if they agreed on the type of error that there was. So you can see that uh, in the binary, the agreement is one. Like everybody agrees that there was definitely a problem with the translation, but uh, they don't really agree uh, how much, like what type of the, the problem there is. Uh, so then, therefore, the sentence level in uh, methodology in that case was a little bit better for that. Oops, sorry. Uh, so we saw that the error markup at the document level is very difficult because it's very hard to ask them just to give like a few, um, just tag a few errors that you saw in the whole in the whole text. Uh, and then for the ranking assessment, you see that the sentence level scenario has higher annotator agreement again in all test sets, including when uh, I add another translator there. There you go. Uh, so for ranking, uh, pairwise ranking, we saw the interannotator agreement was higher if we give random sentences for translators to um, to assess, which is very for me it was very. It was a big discovery. I was I was really surprised uh, with that. We tried to look in the the effort by times, like how much, uh, how long did the translators take to do the assessment? But it was very inconclusive. I didn't get uh, much from there. There was a problem with one of the translators, so I didn't think that was a good uh, result. But uh, when I went to the post-ask questionnaire to ask what they think about the methodology, uh, so you see that the translators, they seem to prefer to judge single sentences than full documents, which was really surprising because I would think that they would rather see, uh, you know, the full document. Um, but they say that they would have preferred uh, to do uh, sentence pairs or paragraphs than full documents. Because, but they said it was easier to spot errors in their full texts, which contradicts the results of statement three. So it was everything was a little bit confusing uh, with this first experiment. It was the first attempt to uh, do to try to do a methodology for document uh, level assessment that I've I've known of. Uh, so. Uh, we decided, I decided to look a little bit in the output of both systems to see what was going on dash there. And I saw that Google seemed to prefer to drop the gender markers more than deep L did, which might make sense, uh, might make the sentence less adequate in terms of um, specifying uh, who is speaking, but the sentence is still very fluent. For example, in example one there, her decision to pull out left everyone involved absolutely stunned. We see that Deep L decided to keep the gender, her, uh, she, and translated it as she, and Google just decided to drop the pronoun, just, just put it in neutral, uh, which is, uh, it works very well in Portuguese. Um, and in, in example two, to recover it is a duty, 
uh, DeepL decided to go with the masculine and Google decided to drop the pronoun as well. So with that, we thought that um, these results might uh, have suggested that translators' uh, personal preferences, they play a role in the document level evaluation as well. So for example, one translator might prefer adequacy over fluency, as in example one, or in, in the case when there is not enough context in the source to specify the gender or to solve the ambiguity, whatever ambiguity there is there, the translators might prefer to drop the gender uh, marker and not commit to any of them. Um, so, yeah, so I looked a little bit more in the disagreements uh, between the translators to see if I could, uh, there is any pattern there that I could understand why they didn't like the document level evaluation. Um, and, um, and we found that the disagreements at the document level are more related to adequacy uh, evaluation. And that could be because uh, of different quality levels in each sentence, right? So a machine translation might have translated one sentence very well, but not the other sentence very, very badly. Uh, so how do you how do you gauge that? How do you give one uh, one single score to that? So in this case, you see that the, the T1, the translator one, disagrees with translator two and translator five in adequacy saying that uh, sports, so translator one say that the sports terms were not translated properly, while translator two and five think it's good enough. So, uh, and the same thing uh, for fluency, T1 and T2 agreed that it was more native, but T5 thought it was uh, not so much good fluency. Um, yeah. And where is the disagreement at the sentence level? They were more related to the ambiguity and the lack of context, uh, which led to mis-evaluation of the sentence by two, translator two and five. So you can see here, uh, uh, he then fired a beautiful through ball leading hazard into the box. Uh, and you see that translator one said that it was not adequate at all. And translator two and five said that it was very adequate. But these two translators, they were unaware that the sentence was about football. And so, for example, the verb to kick and box should be not be translated as it was translated by the machine translation. It should be there was a, a specific terminology for that. So this is one example of the mis-evaluation. So two professional translators said this sentence is very uh, accurate when it's not because it was evaluated out of context. So what we came, what we, we realized with the first experiment is that uh, assign one score per document led to lower inter-annotator agreement for adequacy and ranking compared to if we gave like just random sentences as the, the field, the machine translation field was doing already. Uh, but we saw that without the context, we saw so many uh, risk for uh, so many evaluations and the risk is always uh, higher. So I said, uh, okay, so with this experiment, what is the best setup for document level then? And I was like, okay, I did all this work. I have no idea what's the best yet. So I say, okay, let's uh, gather whatever I learned with this and let's try again. So I tried again. <laughs> and um, so this time I did a modification in the methodology. So I did the sentence level again, where I asked translators to give one score for random single sentences, the exactly the same thing I did before. I asked, that, but then I had two options for document level. I asked them to give one score per individual sentence while having access to the full text. So I call that sentence in context score. So you give one score each sentence, but you have the full text. And then again, I asked them to give one general score for the full document. So I'm calling that document score. So I have random uh, single sentence 
sentencing contexts and documents. So then uh, things start to get very interesting. I use this exactly the same uh, coefficients that I used the last time. Um, I use the same self-assessment post-test -test, uh, questionnaire to measure the effort. I didn't care about time this, this time because it didn't work the first one. I got, uh, I decided to mix up the corpus a little bit. I did this time um, not only much uh, the WMT new test set, but I also looked into the TED talk corpus. Uh, I looked into some uh, literature and product reviews as well. I translated them the exactly same way that I translated before from English into Brazilian Portuguese with Google and DeepL to try the, uh, to do the pairwise comparison. So this time I had a little bit more, I had like eight uh, professional uh, translators from English into Brazilian Portuguese. And you see that again, I distributed the tasks in such a way translators would not see the same text, uh, same sentence twice and the order of the, task, the tasks were randomized. So I avoid as much bias as I could. This time I didn't use the patch tool. I just decided to go very simple, do everything on a spreadsheet so translators can judge everything at the same time. Again, I use the state-of-the-art uh, metrics that we have for human evaluation, adequacy in the same scale as before, fluency in the same scale as before, and error markup, the same uh, error categories, uh, because again, I was just interested in the methodology and annotator agreement. I didn't really want to know which machine translation was better. Um, Yes. Uh, and then, of course, the post-test questionnaire asking everything, because there is when you get your uh, insights on how to improve your uh, methodology. So the results that I got was very interesting. So I have two tables here. The first one is uh, by test sets and then by um, uh, scenarios. So I have the RS, which is the random sentence. S C is the sentence in context, and the D S is the document uh, scores. So I have one uh, per uh, test sets, and then I have an aggreg aggregated um, scores in the table on the side. So you see that for adequacy, I see if I have here. Yeah. So the interannotator scores are very close for ran random sentences and the sentences in context as well. Uh, if I looked at everything, in test set one and in test set two, and also in the, sorry, in the also in the aggregate, aggregated uh, scores as well. So that's a much better result than I got before. And if you see, if you look at the document uh, scores, which is the GS there in the aggregated, you see that they were not, uh, they were uh, lower uh, compared to the other uh, methodology. Uh, and the same thing uh, for fluency, you see that uh, the random sentence and uh, sentence in context, they're again, uh, very, very similar for both groups. And uh, in the case, in, when I aggregate the scores and I put them all together, I see that interannotator agreement is actually higher for random uh, sentences uh, methodology. And this is what uh, gives me, was giving me like, why, why is that? Why do we have higher interannotator agreement for uh, when I give random sentence to translators? Still was, uh, I wasn't very sure why that was happening. Uh, yeah, so when you look at the errors uh, as well, you can see that uh, we had higher error uh, interannotator agreement again for the random sentence methodology, but they were really close uh, to the to the sentencing context uh, as well. This time, I didn't even uh, bother to ask translators to give just one error for the same for the whole document because they hated it last time. I didn't want to make them too tired this time. And, and then for ranking, you see that uh, annotator agreement was higher again for uh, random sentences, but 
close enough to uh, send us in context. And here I have the scores for the whole document and you see negative kappas there uh, happening again in test stage one, for example. So here is the result for the post-task questionnaire. You see that uh, if you look at that, the higher the better, right? So um, a translator found that it was easier to understand both the source in statement one and the translation in the st statement two when they were assessing uh, sentences in context. It was easier to recognize adequacy in statement three and fluency in statement four, spot errors in statement five, choose the best translation in statement six when they had uh, access to the full texts. Uh, they also found that it was easier to assess the quality in general in uh, statement seven and less tiring in statement eight. Um, and they were much more confident with their assessment in uh, statement nine. And you can see that translators think that they gave much more accurate uh, assessments when having access to the full text in the in, in statement 10. So we saw that there was less effort and more satisfaction when assessing the so, uh, sentence in context scenarios. So why is that that the inter annotator agreement was uh, sometimes higher in the random sentence scenario? So this is just one of the quotes that I got from the translators confirming what we saw we thought about in back in 2020 in the first experiment that about the score, giving one score per document, they said occasionally a text would have some great individual sentences translation, uh, but then would have missed some keywords with mistranslation. So it was a hard, it was hard to think which factor should play a bigger role in the score. And uh, the second one say both texts had lots of mistakes. So I had to uh, score based on quantity and quality of the mistakes. It took some calculations. So basically, the problem with uh, giving uh, one score for the whole text is that uh, how can we quantify which mistakes, which errors are more important than the other? So here I have an example of the context span needed to solve gender uh, for this translation uh, in Portuguese. Uh, and the number uh, it's gender and number, sorry, as uh, in sentence, if you look at the sentence uh, 104 and 105 there. So the parts in pink, they related to the gender of the speaker. And the red parts relate to the number, uh, the grammatical number of you, if it's singular or plural. Uh, the orange parts relate to the gender of uh, you, the pronoun you. And the green parts relate to the resolution of uh, each. So you can see there in Portuguese, when we say thank you, we have to know the gender because if you are a male, uh, you have to say obrigado. If you're female, you say obrigada. So you have, we have to have one gender there. Otherwise, we just put everything in the masculine. So you see that to figure out that that uh, thank you so much has to be translated into the feminine, uh, the, the closest sentence that will give us a clue uh, is a sentence 91 because it says, my husband works in this big office. And you can say, okay, so this person has a husband, so she's probably female, but that's not very true because males can also have husbands. So it's not really a given there. Uh, so is it only in sentence 36 that we see and these were the same qualities that I looked for in my own husband, Barack Obama. For that, to understand that who's speaking is Michelle Obama, you have to know who Barack Obama is and who he's married to. So it's like it's a more of a, a world knowledge that the text itself doesn't have. So it's just in a sentence 26 that we understand that uh, the female uh, is a female speaking because she says, I am an example of what's possible when girls from the very beginning of their lives are loved and nurtured by people around them. So now we know that she's uh, referring to herself as a girl, 
So therefore, it's a female. So thank you in 105 has to be translated as the female. And the same thing if you look at sentence 104. So for example, we love you. I need to know if there is one you or two you's or how many you's because I need to translate that into singular or plural. Uh, you know, sometimes depending on the variant, if it's a, a higher register, we're going to need to use a gender there. So I need to know if you use female or male. So you can have a look and see how many sentences you have to go uh, backwards uh, to understand if that you is singular or plural. Uh, so you can see like the, the context is been uh, for the, to be able to tell these things, they might be a little bit longer than we thought she would be. Uh, so here is an example of, this is a real example of mis-evaluation that happens in the happened in that um, experiment. So you see in the sentence uh, 105 there, the thank you so much, machine translation translated that into the masculine. Muito obrigado. When I gave that sentence in the random sentence methodology, all translators thought that it was very adequate. They have a high adequacy. All of them thought it was very fluent. So they gave it a four. All of them gave it a four for uh, fluency. None of them thought there were absolutely no errors, even though one commented that I cannot be sure if it's male or female, but it's correct the way it is. And when I gave the same sentence in the sentence in context methodology, now you see the scores. I have two threes, two fours for adequacy. Uh, for fluency, I have a four. I have a two that is very far. And the type of errors is like mistranslation or old word form. And one translator thought that should be feminine, uh, but didn't want to give any error, didn't consider that that was an error. And the same thing happened for sentence 104. When given that sentence in the random sentence methodology, there is 100% agreement is very adequate, it's very fluent, no errors. When I give it in context, then it's like most of it, little of it, all of it, native, little fluency, word form, mistranslation. So we what we learned with this is that the reason that methodologies with the random single sentence show higher inter-annotator agreement is because raters, evaluators, they tend to accept the translation uh, when adequacy is ambiguous, but the translation is correct, especially if the translation is fluent. Uh, so therefore, uh, sentence 104 and 105 if there is no context to understand why it's wrong, so then everyone agrees that it's very good. Um, yeah, so what do we know so far about document level uh, human evaluation, right? So we think we know that uh, if we if we have a methodology where translators assign one score per text, just one for the full text. It uh, leads to a very low inter-annotator agreement, a great level of effort, and the scores are not very, they don't tell you much. Um, but if you have an evaluation methodology where translators judge single sentences, uh, they random single sentences, sorry, it can have better inter-annotator agreement at the times, but there is a high cost of mis-evaluation cases. And we cannot afford uh, to have more mis-evaluation cases because the machine translation systems that we have nowadays, they are very, uh, very good. So we have to be more strict uh, with the way that we evaluate them. So we, we saw that translators will be more inclined to accept as correct an ambiguous sentence, but especially if it's fluent. And we saw that the context is spent to solve those issues could be longer uh, than expected. So what we, we did with this information. So we decided to create uh, a corpus to try to see if we could um, use those issues uh, to uh, evaluate machine translation. 
So looking at the work that we had done back in 2020, we looked at the list of issues that people told me, oh, I can't translate this because I don't know the gender. I can't translate this because it's ambiguous. I can't translate this because whatever. Uh, so we started looking for challenging text for machine translation system uh, to translate, always looking into Portuguese because that was easier for me. So I took six domains, uh, subtitles, literary, news, reviews, medical and legis legislation, and uh, we created uh, the Della Corpus. So the Della Corpus was annotated uh, by three annotators, and we tagged the issues that would occur when translating uh, from English into Brazilian Portuguese uh, when there was no context in the sentence. So we annotated grammatical gender, grammatical number, ellipses, reference, lexical ambiguity, and terminology. So we developed very detailed guidelines and a decision tree to help us to do the annotation. Uh, and the issues were only tagged if uh, they could not be solved within the sentence. So I have our decision tree here. I hope you can see some of it. So the first questions that we would ask is, um, can this issue, if the sentence contain an issue, for example, if the sentence was, uh, uh, what is it? Uh, so I know that there is an issue there, it. So can this issue be solved within the sentence? If uh, yes, if there was a solution within the sentence, we didn't care to annotate that. But if not, then we would... Um, try to see if that was a anaphora kind of error or a morphosyntactic like gender and number or a polysemy uh, like lexical ambiguity or terminology. And then so we would annotate up to the end. So we three annotators annotated that, and then we did a test with a fourth annotator. We gave them the guidelines and the decision tree. And I asked them to annotate the, the corpus uh, following the guidelines and the trees that we had. And we got a CAPA score of 6.1, which is a very substantial agreement. And I checked the, and the disagreements that we had was only disagreements if a sentence should be annotated or not. We didn't disagree what type of error or issue, sorry, was there in that sentence. We just disagreed if it should be annotated or not. So then after the fourth annotator, uh, we revised the corpus and now it's uh, available there. So these are some examples of the issues we annotated. For example, in example A, uh, they actually hurt. They had to be annotated as a reference related to the term. Uh, for example, the choice. So it was the choices uh, that we make, they actually hurt. And because choice is a feminine in Portuguese, um, it was also annotated as a gender issue. Um, if you look at uh, ellipses, uh, the sentence is, in my laughter, I bail it out, yes, I do. Uh, so do uh, is an ellipsis because it's a lack of information that has to be guessed by the reader. Uh, so we annotated do as uh, lexical ambiguity as well, because do has different uh, translations in Portuguese. So it could be, uh, yes, I do, could be like, yes, I make, or, you know, yes, I think, or, and, and so many. Uh, for gender, we annotated loads because uh, Portuguese is very dependent on grammatical gender. So, for example, I'm surprised to see you back so early. We annotated gender for that. Uh, grammatical number, you should be more agreeable. So we have many problems with number there because if you is plural in that sentence, it has to agree with all the adjectives uh, as well. Um, Lexical ambiguity was very interesting um, because uh, there's so many examples of lexical ambiguity in the text that we could find. Uh, so, for example, there was just one sentence that was period. So we don't know what it is about. So we annotated that. Uh, terminology was uh, not so much annotated. We didn't have that many, but we had a few examples. For example, wind farm in Portuguese is translated more as a wind park instead of farm. So that's a specific terminology. So we created that corpus um, 
and it's available online if you're interested to have a look at it here's the link to to um to the website to my github uh, so we have uh, 60 documents in six different domains, and it can be used uh, as a test set for evaluation of machine translation, training or testing corpus of MT, or if you want to do some linguistic analysis on the context issues. Uh, so we're trying to add more documents and different translations because the, because this was based on translations from English into Portuguese, uh, we uh, I am sure that other languages, other non-romance uh, romance languages, we have different issues, uh, for example. So it will be interesting to see what issues overlap. So after the corpus was compiled, uh, what I wanted to know is say, OK, I have this big corpus with all these context level um, issues. Uh, how much span do I need to solve every single one of the issues annotated in the corpus? So for that, what I did was a bit crazy. I just counted for every single issue annotated in the corpus. I, I counted uh, the shorted context span necessary to solve those issues. So uh, what I saw is that there are very different types of context. So there is the preceding, preceding context, which is sentences before the source sort of, sort of sentences, following, which is the sentences after the source sentence that you want to, uh, with the issue that you want to translate. Some context spans, they start uh, before the sentence and they go a little bit over. So you need all of it. Sometimes uh, it's either before or after, it, it doesn't really matter. Sometimes you need the full text uh, to be able to, to solve that example because it's so uh, subtle the way that it is that you actually need to read everything to have an idea. But there are some issues that they actually are not in the text at all. You need some world knowledge to be able to solve that. So how would machine translation do that without this world knowledge? So uh, what I saw is that uh, when I counted them, and you can see here the results uh, by uh, issue. So I look at all the, the issues that I annotated in the Della Corpus, reference ellipses, gender, number, lexical ambiguity, and terminology. You can see that the majority of the context uh, span position is right before the sentence that you want to translate. Uh, but if you look at uh, lexical ambiguity, uh, the context position to solve lexical ambiguities, they are very diverse. They happen a lot preceding the sentence that you with the issue, but they happen a lot uh, after that. So if we do a machine translation at document level just with preceding sentences, we might lose uh, the, the sentence that we solve that issue if they are following uh, the sentence. And the most common uh, issues that um, we have is gender and lexical ambiguity, which makes sense because Portuguese is a very uh, gender-based language. Uh, so when I looked at the context of how, how long the context is, we see that um, the average context is been uh, preceding the source sentence, they tend to be longer uh, than the average uh, following. And the uh, longest average context span, uh, they are for gender and lexical ambiguity. And I think this next um, table is the most interesting one in my view. So here I separated it by domain. Uh, so you can see, for example, here that gender is one of the most tagged issues in every domain. Like I say, it makes sense because Portuguese is a gender-based language. Uh, but lexical ambiguity is also the most tagged in the literary and medical domains, uh, if you look here. So yeah, so you, you can see here that gender was tagged in every single um, domain but also lexical ambiguity was uh, tagged as well. Um, yeah, and uh, if you look at reference, it was very much annotated, but especially in reviews, 
uh, in the news domain, which makes sense, I think is a, a, re, a huge characteristic of the domain of reviews because you're reviewing a product and then you say this product is great, eat, la la la, eat, la la la. Uh, ellipses and terminology, what well, they were not so much tagged, uh, but when tagged, ellipses is the second longest context pane that we have in the news domain. But for me, the most interesting in this case is the number, the grammatical number. We see that in subtitles, uh, the grammatical number has a huge uh, context span length. So you see it goes up to 29, around 29 uh, sentences, the average length, and the median is around 17 sentences. And this is something very characteristic of the subtitling domain because you can only tell that this you that people talk about should be in the plural because they are talking to an audience right in the beginning of the talk. It's generally not specified during the talk uh, that, that you should be plural. Yeah, so what we learned so far, I'm almost done, stay with me. Uh, what we learned so far is that the context has been necessary to solve those issues that we tagged. They are very dependent on the domain. For example, in the case of the literature and subtitles, we had the longest context spans. Uh, that's something that we found out I wasn't expecting. Um, it does not seem to be related to the length of the sentence in the corpus because the average sentence length for literature domain is the shortest in the corpus, even though the context span in literature uh, was one of the longest. So how can we use that information? Um, how different issues would be different for uh, different languages? Would uh, the solution for those issues be in the same sentence for different languages? Um, I, don't, I don't know. So what are we going to do now? So WMT has been doing a document level evaluation, like I said, since 2020. And uh, we're the, the metric shared task that is also um, done in, in WMT now, uh, we are trying to, uh, this year, we are trying to do a paragraph evaluation to see if the metrics uh, can um, understand the quality of a full paragraph and with all the coherence and cohesion that it comes to. Um, are the state of the art human metrics like fluency, adequacy, and error, and the automatic evaluation metrics that we use a lot and we have known that uh, sometimes it's not very good, like blue scores, for example, are they able to capture the quality level of document systems realistically? Do we need to modify those uh, metrics? Do we need new one? Uh, we have now some sort of doc blue, which is a document level blue scores. We have a modified comment. I don't know if you know about the automatic metric comment. They have a, a, a doc comment, uh, but I haven't seen the um, correlation with human assessment, for example. In about human evaluation scores, like fluency and adequacy, do we need new ones? Uh, do we still need to assess all of them all the time? Or could we come up with one that could, um, you know, just take uh, everything in one? And uh, well, what about the GPT models? Like, can we use that? And my answer to you is, I don't know. We still have so much to do in document level evaluation. We know uh, little, uh, in the research in the field has been growing a lot since 2020, since when we started, but we still have, there are loads of things that we don't know yet. So there's loads of future uh, research to be done. And uh, yeah, and I'm looking forward to see where we're gonna go with all of this. So uh, this is all from me today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for such an interesting talk. Um, yeah, lo lots of, of uh, information and lots of questions, which uh, is very good because it means that uh, 
there's always something to do. Yeah. So, um, yeah, um, let's open the, the floor to, to questions. Uh, we have a question from Hadil. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, Sheila, that was very interesting, really interesting. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I have a couple of questions for you. Uh, the first one is about the data set that you have on your GitHub. So you, uh, it's open source, isn't it? Yeah. And it has the document seven human evaluation. The corpus, yes. Okay, very well. Um, do you agree that uh, what I see from uh, the questions that you had uh, the annotator asked you ask them uh, and at the end uh, about a questionnaire questionnaire you ask them about their preference and I see in the two times you ask them they prefer to be having seg segment level um, uh, evaluation is this true so in the first experiment when I only gave them random sentence in full document they prefer to do the single sentence in the second exper experiment, when I give them random sentence, sentence in context, and document, they prefer sentence in context. Mm -hmm. But one of the questions that you had at the end, whether they take, I think the preference was five for sentence, random sentence, but rather than document. So they prefer to uh, sort of evaluate the sentence rather than the document. Did I understand this correctly? Yeah, they prefer to give one score per sentence in all scenarios. If I give random sentence or documents, they prefer random sentence. If I give random sentence, sentence in context and documents, they will prefer the they prefer to give one score per sentence. It doesn't matter how. Mm, I see. Can we conclude from from your several experiments that the MT performance is sort of inversely proportional to the length of the uh, translated document. Because as I understand from uh, the annotation for random sentences that they, they actually give um, wrong confidence in the MT performance. So when they had the context, actually that the translation was a mistranslation. I am not sure I got everything you said, sorry. I say that the, the, the performance of the MT degrades with, when you have longer text. But do, do you think this can be also concluded through your studies? Okay, see, I wasn't evaluating the quality of, I wasn't interested in evaluating the quality of the translation. I was interested in seeing if the annotators agreed. Uh, so the inter annotator agreement. So I didn't look if Google Translation was good or not. I, I looked into do translators agree if this translation is good or not? You know what I mean? So I was interested in the methodology and the annotator agreement. Mm -hmm. So what I saw was that translators, they were very confident in the scores that they gave in the evaluation when they were able to see the full document and score and tag the error or give one score per sentence given the full document that's that's the what i i looked into okay thank you thank you very much Thanks. Yeah. Uh, but yeah i think you can also flip what hadil said and say oh maybe we have an unrealistic uh, view about how good the uh, uh, empty works because uh, we look at segments whereas you show that as soon as you have this uh, uh, longer paragraphs uh, mm -hmm. context uh, the, the accuracy goes goes down uh, but yeah, I guess that's to be investigated properly. I think we have a question from uh, Natalie and then Elliot. And Sheila, maybe you can stop sharing the screen because okay. in this way we'll, we'll be able to see more faces. Uh, yes, okay, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, thank you very much for this um, very interesting and very um, original, I think, uh, uh, presentation. Uh, it, it's really so interesting to to look at the inter annotator agreement of professional translators and your results are really telling interesting things because it seems that the problem re lies in the different textual genres you can have in a wide variety of domains 
be it literature or specialized domains, because of course a recipe doesn't have doesn't present the same linguistic characteristics than as a research article in earth sciences, for example. And I was wondering whether it would be interesting to select your annotators, because in fact, you know, translators are specialized in different domains, not all the time, but most of the time. And if you want them to agree on a review or to agree on a medical text, maybe it also depends on how uh, specialized they are in the specialist area. See what I mean? So, I see what you mean. You see, you say that uh, depending on the uh, uh, area of the translators, they're going to give different scores for the evaluation of that domain. Is that it? Yes, because we know, for example, that uh, uh, medical translation requires uh, 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 some part of specialist uh, knowledge to be able to translate medical text. Yeah. So if the translator doesn't have this specialist knowledge, how can he or she correctly evaluate, uh, assess the translation according to the criteria you gave them? Yeah, no, I understand that. Uh, if we were building a machine translation system for uh, a specific uh, medical text, I would say get uh, a specialist to evaluate that for sure. Uh, but uh, because of the texts that I had, they were quite general. They were different domains, but quite general. Uh, I, I am not sure mm. that you needed to do it if being specialized in one would make that much difference. Because for example, news, you could just read the whole news to be able to tell um what the news is about right because it's world yeah. knowledge and uh, so on so yeah i agree with you um if it's a very specialized domain it's better to have specialized translators to uh, assess that to you but in a general domain i think uh translators in general could uh, could be able to do it especially if you have access to the full document yeah yeah yeah, I was just thinking about that because you had a medical, you had medical text in, in the corpus. Yeah, the, but the medical texts was a, a little bit general. They were like leaflets about, you know, that it's distributed to the public. So they are in a more uh, accessible uh, yeah. kind of language. For a wider audience. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much. No problem. So, yeah, thank you, Elliot. Um, yes, thank you, Sheila, for this interesting talk on um, the development of a methodology for the human evaluation of machine translation. I'm wondering, have you looked into whether this, um, this methodology or these techniques apply to um, automated confidence estimation of machine translation? Yeah? That's, That's a question. A, I think you've done some work in the area, if I'm not mistaken. I have not looked in the confidence estimation for that yet, um, but it, that would be very interesting thing to do um, because I think quality estimation is just so uh, good and so robust right now that it's uh, uh, it's very close to human evaluation of uh, sorry to evaluation of MT right now. The two areas are. I feel like they're kind of converging right now. So we could be one one way that we're going to go in the future. What an interesting prospect. If they do converge, then we won't need to uh, burden translators with these tasks, impossible tasks, like give me one score for this two-page machine translation. That, mm. that's, that's just an unreasonable request. We shouldn't be asking translators to do things like that. Yeah, I don't I don't know if you're gonna if you're not gonna need translators to assess yet. I think I think machine translation is quite good and things are getting even evolving even faster now. But uh, 
I still think the human human evaluation is the gold standard. And uh, if we want to evaluate uh, machine translation very strictly, we need the translators and we need strict uh, ways to evaluate it. We need uh-huh. to get creative as as <laughs> to evaluate the translations. So my question then is, if human evaluation is is to remain as the gold standard, but we want to know as to what degree does um, confidence estimation overlap with the human gold standard. How, mu- how much they correlate, is that it? Yes, that's, that, that's an interesting question. That's yes? a very interesting question. So it's it's future it's future work, guys. So if anyone wants to work with that. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for the question. More questions, comments? Well, while people still think about this, um, I found very interesting the negative kappa scores. <laughs> Me too. And, and, and that's something that uh, you, you rarely see. And um I'm just wondering. So, essentially, to get negative kappa means that uh, your uh, the probability that uh, your annotators agree is lower than the probability by chance, and and that that makes me think that it is not an indication that uh, uh, your annotators didn't do a good job, but they had very different views about what they need to 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 annotate, and and I wonder whether that's. Uh, an issue with annotation at the document level because yeah as Elliot said before you have two pages you 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 put these poor people to read two pages of text and say now tell me is this good or not yeah whereas whereas you have a much finer grain and then you come with the conclusion yeah yeah no it's completely that the 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 false I blame the guidelines because there was none (laughs) (laughs) the guideline was tell me if something is wrong with the text and tell me what is wrong. And I just gave them like four types of errors. So uh, it was not great. They didn't like it. So, but I agree with you. It was because the negative kappa was that they had absolutely no idea where they should look at. And if, okay, if a, a mistranslation should be, you know, more penalized than the other. And if so, why? And, you know, how like everyone had a different thinking so they did find the errors they just didn't agree what errors there were so that was that was on me so but like the good thing is that now we know we cannot ask this kind of things you know so we need to be more specific because the humans are um you know subjective and they will look into the things that are more a specific for them so a mistranslation for me in gender could not be something uh very bad but for other person no this because there is no gender here uh, no this is completely so you know so we have to have some kind of criteria more a more defined criteria when we have the guidelines for the translators yeah thank you um natalie had a, a hand up i don't know whether that was by accident no, I just I'm I'm going to be quick because Felix has not uh, talked <laughs> yet. No, I I I perfectly agree with what you said, Sheila. I think when tra- translators are used to evaluate translations, I mean in their in their job, and so um, uh, when 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 we ask translators to evaluate human translations for uh, learner corpora, for example. Uh, they they want to have really uh, specific typology of difficulties or criteria uh, uh, because that's what they're used to. So maybe it would yield different results. Yeah, as yeah. you said. But it's very hard to get uh, like eight, ten translators that are specialized in a specific things. And their very uh, experience in t- machine translation evaluation, and they're available, and you have money <laughs> to pay for them. So it's very hard to do that. So 
Um, generally, that's what's done in the community, right? Sometimes not even professional translators are used. It's just bilinguals and, you know, tell me if that's good because of the cost for that, the cost of the time-wise and money-wise, is it's very high. But yeah, for sure, maybe that's one thing that we're going to have to start thinking about. If machine translation systems are getting so good, we're going to have to be getting even better to, uh, in a way, to evaluate them. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Felix? Uh, yeah, thanks. I was also going to comment on the, the, the criteria that you can use for, for document assessment. But before, let me just say that this was a fantastic presentation. I was taking notes of some questions that I had, but before I had the occasion to uh, to ask them, you uh, re replied to them in, in the presentation. Because so, this uh, project is going on for so long, I know. <laughs> yeah. I can yeah. anticipate the questions. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and also I told you this before, uh, this is a fantastic name for a project. So no ambiguity in terms of gender or number there. For those who don't know Portuguese, DELA, the, the acronym of, of the project means her project, right? So yeah, no ambiguity is there. No, but um, <laughs> related to the, the question of the, the criteria, you know, if you want to have a very good uh, feedback from users, you also need to have a very clear brief, right? And, and the criteria, you know, asking about adequacy just in general terms of fluency for a text, it's not precise enough. That, that was the, the conversation that we were having. So uh, maybe the, these, uh, these criteria do not scale up so well from the sentence to the, to the document. Mm. And, and, and perhaps the discussion should be about what criteria do you have in a text that you can really use in terms of, of this discussion. I don't know, in translation, you use things like coherence and consistency and mm -hmm. the, the completeness of the message and so on. And also the distribution of the errors, if they are too many errors in a few sentences and then several sentences without any errors. So yeah, there's work to do there. And you're the right man for the job. <laughs> <laughs> Woman. <laughs> Woman, yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, I, I see the things that... Um, I think what I tell what I tell my students, I think there's some of my students in the audience that I force them to watch this. Uh, but I tell my students that uh, it's very rare that we have like completely new ideas in the field. We generally go back. Uh, the ideas have been there, but we didn't have the computer power to do it. For example, neuro machine translation is an older idea that couldn't be done until we had the, the computer power to do it. So uh, what we have to do, what I think we have to do is go back to, okay, how was translation first assessed there, back there in the ALPAC report? What did they do there? Can we now look at the, because the way they did the evaluation there was very strict. So can we take any of these things and come back? Because now the machine translation is doing what they expected like in the 60s, you know? So let's go back there. Let's see what does the user, the reader need now from the translations that we, we're doing right now. Let's combine them into a metric or in a kind of assessment that we that we can do, you know? But like, that's, that's loads of work. That's a full PhD there. <laughs> but I agree with you, yeah. Thank you. Uh, more questions. I see that there is uh, there are some uh, comments in uh, in the chat. Uh, oh. uh, don't, don't be shy. Uh, oh, I see comments yeah. about the the pay, the GPT models mm -hmm. to evaluate translation. Is that the one that was um, published today from uh, Tom Comkey and Christian Federman? Yeah, that's the paper. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, yeah. So I saw I saw that one uh, today. It was published when two days ago. Yeah, I just saw it, and I'm like, and I I couldn't read everything. Uh, I was finishing the slides for this, but I saw that. So they propose a new metric called Jemba, and but I think I read in it in the introduction that I they only do sentence level yeah. evaluation, yeah. right? Yes, that's true, and a little bit of segment level as well, but. 
uh, again, as people say in the chat, it seems to be very lackluster and it's... Uh, and uh, it's how long is the segment there? Is it like a paragraph or... I haven't gone through it very thoroughly. Yeah, I didn't. Totally I couldn't read. Through it, yeah. But look, I think it's great because there is another paper looking in chat GPT. We're looking in chat GPT now, and hopefully I'll have a paper ready in a few days. <laughs> um, and uh, I don't know if you test chat GPT for uh, translation, and it's and it's quite good, uh, but. Uh, if if I'm comparing with a few different ones and not to spoil, you're going to have to read my paper if EAMT accepts it. Um, but uh, the things is that it's it's a big step, um, not not a big step. It's it's it. Sometimes it goes a little bit further than Google Translate, for example. But it's still the the thing with Chat GPT is that it can be tricked. Uh, so if you said if it translate correctly, for example, gender, and I say, oh, that's not the right gender. And it goes like, oh yeah, I'm sorry. And then translate completely wrong. <laughs> so if you're using chat GPT for translations, be make sure that your input, your, in, your input prompt for the chat GPT is proper and try it again a few other times because it might give you a uh, different. Uh, so the thing with chat GPT is that I think it is trained in more monolingual data than NMT, which is in a in, is in a parallel data. It tends to be more biased towards English. Uh, so, um, you know, we still don't know what's in there, but I saw these two papers uh, and uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward of everything we can do with uh, ChatGPT and maybe we can have even hybrid forms of NMT with a large, large language model as well, and that will make translations better. And if they can create a metric with that, that could have a look at the whole document. Uh, why not? You know, let's let's see if we can correlate that with human judgments and see what we can uh, construct from there. Thank you. Okay, we had a hand up. Uh earlier but to disappear so i don't know whether that was by accident um meanwhile uh, i'm going to read uh, uh tomek's uh, uh comment in the chat so uh he says uh, thank you for the presentation uh all great points above a small one from me it sorts of cast a shadow over our trust in human evaluation evaluator especially when there are not so many in a study if a human professional translator can't define the context based on a sentence like uh, you're quoted uh, with hazard to balls and box uh, and consequently misevaluate, then I would doubt uh, the other evaluations by that person too. That sentence contained many hints with, within it, it without the context. Mm, I don't so, know what sentence you're talking about, but there are sentences that they have absolutely no hints at all. And that's what we annotated in the in the Della Corpus. Uh, for example, if you have a sentence, thank you, there is absolutely no way we can tell how to translate that in Portuguese. You're generally going to go for the masculine because it's like the, the general one. But if we put them in context as a female, it's wrong. There is absolutely no clue, no cue in the sentence. If the sentence is... Um, what is it like in Portuguese? I could try and drop the it and just translating as what is. Um, it could be okay, but maybe if you put that back in context, it's completely doesn't make sense or it doesn't sound fluent. So I agree with you that some sentence might have the hint, but the sentence that we looked into, none of them had a hint at all. So I think it's... Um, we couldn't just um, doubt the rest of the evaluation of that person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, Sheila, this sentence is the one in which you had the the box, the grandiaria for the the football field. Oh, and, the football one. Yeah, and yeah. The, the hint there for me, the but this requires word knowledge. Is the name of the player Eddie Hazard, right? Yeah. Uh, that's and, that, that's what I meant. Yeah, sorry, sorry yeah. to butt in. This yeah, is a yeah. question from 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 me, Sheila. Okay. Uh, so in itself, what I meant was that in itself, in this sentence, you had the name of the player and you had uh, two uh, items for two vocabulary items that actually are very clearly related to the football context. 
So with that world knowledge, which is a prerequisite for a professional translator, I would say, they they, they should have uh, got the meaning right or got the evaluation right. Uh, so that is what I meant. I didn't mean um, I didn't mean any. Uh, it partially relates to gender because Hazard is a is a male player as well, right? Okay, but like you see, let's think that that is someone, remember, I was trying to imitate the state of the art evaluation, right? So uh, the difference is that I was using professional translators, sometimes we don't. Uh, the name hazard, uh, okay, it is in capital letters, but hazard also means something else, right? Yes. <laughs> so let's imagine that uh, machine translation is putting capital letters where it shouldn't be. So then say leading hazard into the box. So it could be, it could mean something else. If you don't know who hazard is, um, uh, it, it's, it's hard to evaluate that if you don't know. And if you don't have time to search uh, online what it is. So, okay. Yeah. What I, what I meant, what, what I meant is, was that it was a, um, a collection of a few hints within the sentence, not just the name. So looking at those, uh, having a translator's mind, you should be able to, you know, connect the the the, the three items, even if they are unknown to you. Um, yeah, I, I know what you mean, but maybe translators are more uh, picky if they have to translate. The translation was already there and it made sense and they just needed to give it a nice score. You see what I mean? So if you don't have that word knowledge and you just go like, oh, okay, so fire, ball, hazard sounds good to me. If they have maybe if they had to actually translate it, maybe they would be they would be doing more research, but um, mm. Okay, yeah. Well, still, that was my reaction. You know, if 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 you see such a thing happening, and uh, and he, and you are saying yes, those were professional translators evaluating it, then the evaluation of that person is uh, somehow flawed because there was not enough of that translator's thinking process going into even the evaluation process itself. Right. But but maybe I'm too harsh. I, th I think you're being too harsh, but <laughs> yeah, okay. But maybe if we're being harsh with machine translation system, we have to be harsh with the translators that we hire. I, I think so. We have to be fair. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Any hey, more questions, comments? Um, we have a comment about. Um, uh, the prompts to, to chat GTP. So I'll let uh, everybody read. Uh, um, it's that uh, one from Gokan. Yeah. Where is Gokan? Gokan, just speak up. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Sorry. Uh, my voice is not in its best day today, but. All I was saying was that I, I was also experimenting with ChatGPT Chat GPT a lot, um, trying like try to do uh, both translation quality evaluation and also trying to um, how to say um, chat with ChatGPT to be to translate better, informing by saying like if I put a sentence, I say the gender is female, uh, it should be formal, not informal. And then let it translate it. In this case, it gives me better translation uh, compared to the cases in which, like in Google Translate, you simply paste the sentence and you'll get just one translation. But of course, uh, while well, there's still a long way uh, for it to be used in a real translation scenario, because again, from my experience, the quality is very low. But as it accepts up to 4,000 uh, tokens now, potentially we can think that it, it will kind of provide solutions in the future for document level problems of translation. But yeah, still it's uh, one company, one system, and we don't know what will happen in the future. Yeah, no, I am very excited about it as well. I want to see like how much we can do in terms of understanding the whole context with chat GPT. Uh, but like I say, it, can, it still can be tricked, uh, you know, so. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, so try try one of your experiments tricking it. Uh, do you see like it, it? And it's very confident in the wrong answers it gives. So, 
it's a very it's very fluent uh but wrong um but yeah mm-hmm. but i'm i'm also excited about it it could be it could be another step forward uh a little better uh tra- automatic translations that we might have and i am just uh, trying to see if better evaluation can come out of that uh, as well so i was excited about the the metric um but uh, let's see if they're going to do a document level one. Uh, but yeah, the, the future is here. So uh, chat GPT is just, the, just another another thing that came uh, for machine translation. And I'm sure there are going to be more as well. Sure. There's a lot of things to talk about it now, but I don't want to <laughs> dominate the topic with that. But thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Sheila. We we are coming to kind of the end of the time we allocated. Um, lots of ideas, very very interesting presentation. Um, yeah, I think uh, uh, I think people will get in touch with you. I'm pretty sure they will asking you questions. Um, hopefully, some of them will be inspired and, and work on this topic uh, as PhD students, as researchers, um, so yeah. on. Yeah, please do. If you have any ideas you want to develop and you want my help or anything, I'm always up for research. I'm very excited to do research all the time. So just hit me up and uh, let's let's do something. Thank you very much for inviting me, Constantine. I really appreciate the time. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And thank you very much to the audience for coming. Uh, We had over 100 people at some point. Uh, So, um, yeah, well done. (laughs) (laughs) Well done, you. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you for coming.